You're watching Behind the Headlines. I'm Lee Pacquia. My guest today is Marsha Coyle, Chief Washington Correspondent at the National Law Journal and author of The Robbers Court, The Struggle for the Constitution. She joins us from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Welcome. Well, thanks a lot, Lee. I'm happy to be with you. So you focused in your book on four major cases in front of the Supreme Court dealing with health care, campaign finance, guns and race. Why did you pick these particular cases and how did you tie them all together? Okay, well, I really had some concrete reasons for picking them. Uh, one, I, I wanted to find what we would call landmark or signature decisions of the Roberts Court. That's when Chief Justice John Roberts uh, became Chief Justice in the year 2005. So they, they had to be big decisions. I also wanted 5-4 rulings, not because I wanted to show the court as always divided 5-4. In fact, Lee, as you probably know, more than 50% of the court's decisions every term are either unanimous or 7-1 or 7-2 uh, or 8-1 decisions. So I, I but I, I really feel that the 5-4 decisions teach us the most about how individual justices approach the Constitution. Mm. And then I also wanted cases that had just really compelling backstories so that I could tell people how these cases got to the Supreme Court, not just what happened when they arrived at the Supreme Court. And then finally, I wanted decisions that had shelf life, meaning uh, they involved issues that were likely to come back to the court and that people cared about and talked about maybe over the dinner table or at work. And I'd like to say I'm really prescient here, but uh, here we are in the, at the end of the current term and race is back on the docket. Next term, we have another big campaign finance case. And I'll, I'll bet you anything that either next term or the term after, we're going to see again health care challenges and maybe even guns. Yeah, it's always the closed cases that are more interesting, in my opinion. Um, you had this really interesting characterization uh, for this uh, current crop of Supreme Court justices. You said the Supreme Court today is marked by, quote, a confident conservative majority with a muscular sense of power and willingness to act aggressively and distinctly unconservatively, unquote. How so? Right. Well, when you think of a conservative court, uh, and I'm using that term not politically, but in, in terms of, you know, a conservative judge is generally someone who uh, respects prior decisions, will, when there is a balance, uh, defer to Congress or local elected officials because they are closest to the people who, who vote for them and the Supreme Court uh, isn't accountable in the same way, uh, is, is reluctant to take giant strides in the law to, to give a jolt to the legal system. And yet in these five, in these uh, four cases that I picked, the, the court was not so conservative in that aspect. They showed a willingness to overturn earlier decisions, some not particularly old either. And, uh, you know, I, I, I see this, I wouldn't say judicial activism so much as just willing and very confident to exercise the power that they have as the as justices on the Supreme Court. Mm. It sounds like the Roberts Court is uh, much less predictable than its predecessors. Would you agree with that? Well, I think so at this point, Lee, mainly uh, because it's still a young court, and I point that out in my book. And, and you think, well, how can this be a young court when you have, uh, f say, four justices who are over 70 years old? Uh, but it's a young court in the sense that we had four new justices come on the Supreme Court just in f a five-year period between 2005 and 2010, and we're still learning a lot about them. So mm -hmm. it, it is kind of hard to, to really uh, put a label on the Roberts Court at this point. Uh, I think we're going to learn an awful lot more about the Roberts Court by the end of next week when the current term ends. So it, it, it's hard to, to really judge it. Uh, and it's a little more unpredictable uh, in the sense that not only aren't we sure of John Roberts, 
uh, but also Justice Kennedy, who is now the center of the court and became the center of the court when Sandra Day O'Connor left uh, in 2006. Mm. So, uh, you know, we just have to play it out and see, see really where they come down on the hot button issues that they're deciding right now. Right. You have also noted that this Supreme Court has a strong disdain for Congress. Where has that popped up? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That comes out in oral arguments. Whenever the court is dealing with a law that Congress has enacted, uh, that they are questioning whether it's constitutional, comments from the bench, particularly uh, by Justice Scalia, to a lesser extent from the Chief Justice and Justice uh, Alito, uh, it's really clear that they don't have a lot of respect for how Congress legislates. Uh, they feel it doesn't legislate clearly in it, their statutes. And, and also, they, they question their motives uh, behind the legislation, which is really rather unusual. Courts, the Supreme Court generally doesn't do that. It takes a law on its face. So yeah, I, I really think uh, there's uh, considerable disdain for Congress, at least on uh, the conservative wing of the court. All right. Speaking of Justice Scalia, in the Myriad Genetics case uh, recently decided, Justice Scalia filed a concurrence that said, uh, with respect to molecular biology, he is, quote, unable to affirm those details on my own knowledge <laughs> or even my own belief, unquote. Was he just being humble here, or does he doubt the basics of modern biology? This has to be one of the most interesting concurrences I've read. Well, I wish I was uh, inside Justice Scalia's mind uh, more often than not, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I think uh, it, it was viewed as being humble. Uh, this was a very technical majority opinion uh, that uh, Justice Thomas wrote, and it really delved into the science of DNA and eons and uh, other parts of the, the DNA structure. Uh, so I think, in a, I think he was being somewhat hum humble. Uh, and I'll tell you, some patent lawyers that I talked to afterwards thought it was downright weird uh, that he wrote what he wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he was being honest, I think, that uh, while he agreed with how the case came out, uh, he, he really wouldn't be able to say that all the science that was used to reach that judgment was, was correct. Yeah, never a dull moment with that one. Uh, no, on, never. <laughs> on the court today, we have uh, four justices over the age of 70. Where are the odds that one or more of them will announce their retirement at the end of this term? I really don't think we're going to have any retirements this term. I think, I think it might be more likely next term or uh, the term after. But I, I don't sense that any of the justices is really ready to uh, retire. I mean, a lot of attention focuses on Justice Ginsburg because of her age. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to say, I think that she uh, is really into the work of the court. And I think particularly since uh, her husband died, that that is something that keeps her going. So I, I don't anticipate anything this term. Mm. Marsha, I can't let you go without asking for your prediction on what may be uh, the court's biggest decision this term. How do you expect them to come out on the gay marriage case, uh, the, the California one, and uh, also for the Federal Defense of Marriage Act? Well, I'm usually really reluctant to predict because this court, in those two cases, it has so many options that it could take. But I, my sense was after the oral arguments in the cases that the court is not ready to step out and say that there is a uh, constitutional right uh, to, uh, to marriage for same-sex couples nationally. Uh, my sense is that the Federal Defense of Marriage Act that defines marriage uh, for all federal purposes as between a man and a woman is in real trouble. I wouldn't be surprised to see the court strike down the federal law. Uh, on the Proposition 8 case, uh, I sense they may just get rid of it and not address the key question, which is whether a state here, California, can also define marriage as between a man and a woman. There are some procedural problems that may dictate how that case comes out. So I think they're going to be cautious. Mm. Well, we'll certainly be finding out soon enough. Marsha, thank you for your time today. Oh, my pleasure, Lee. That's Marsha Coyle, Washington correspondent at the National Law Journal. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our updates on Twitter, and you can see more of our videos, of course, on YouTube. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.